That evening, I was driving along the deserted roads of Montana. The area is remote, sparsely populated with few cars passing by, and the nearest town was at least 30 kilometers away. The sun was already setting, its orange rays casting the hills in muted warm tones, but the light seemed ominous to me, as if it foretold something bad. The wind was light, barely rustling the leaves, which looked dusty and lifeless in this region. There were hardly any cars, just the occasional pickup truck with local farmers or old sedans passing by. It felt like I was alone on that road. My truck rumbled monotonously, lulling me to sleep. It was getting dark, and I started thinking about stopping to rest. In the distance, I saw lights, faint at first, like a mirage on the horizon. As I got closer, I realized it was a small motel. The motel was typical for such places, a two-story building with peeling paint, old wooden steps leading to the entrance. The area around the motel was empty, just a dusty road and a couple of old cars parked in the lot. I noticed an old pickup truck and a station wagon, possibly belonging to other travelers who had stopped for the night. Nothing remarkable, but maybe that was its charm. I parked my truck and got out. The air had a faint scent of ozone, like it does before a storm, though the sky was perfectly clear. As I closed the truck door, I noticed a man standing at the edge of the parking lot, under the light of a solitary street lamp. He was smoking a cigarette, lazily exhaling smoke into the night. At first glance, he looked like a biker. He wore a worn leather jacket with patches, heavily worn jeans, and heavy boots. His hair was long and tangled, and his beard looked like it hadn't seen a razor in months. His face was stern, with deep-set eyes reflecting the glow of his cigarette. He looked like someone who had seen a lot in life, and not all of it pleasant. We exchanged a brief glance, and I felt a chill run down my spine. This guy didn't look friendly. He nodded to me silently, then turned away again, lost in his thoughts. The street lamp flickered as if trying to add even more gloom to the scene. I headed towards the motel entrance. The boards underfoot creaked slightly, as if warning of every step. Inside, behind the reception desk, stood an old woman. She looked like she had long since lost interest in life and people. Her face was gaunt, with deep wrinkles that seemed to carve her skin like dried-up riverbeds. Her eyes were colorless, empty, like the dead windows of an abandoned house. She wore a neat but clearly old hat, as if she still lived in the past. As I approached, the old woman lifted her gaze, and something resembling irritation flickered in her eyes. She offered no greeting, just silently waited for me to speak. It seemed she wasn't happy to see me or anyone else in this place, as if guests disrupted her usual peace. I rented a room, paid in cash, and took the key with a large metal tag. The number seven inches was engraved on the tag, and the metal felt cold against my fingers. The old woman remained in place, briefly nodding towards the staircase leading to the second floor. Climbing the creaky steps, I found the door to my room and opened it. Inside it smelled musty and slightly sweet, as if the old paint scent had mixed with the dust. The room was simple, even shabby. A small bed with a faded bedspread that seemed to have seen better days twenty years ago. There was a chipped wardrobe against the wall, and a dusty TV with antennas pointed in different directions, like broken horns. On the nightstand by the bed, a dim lamp cast light on only part of the room. The walls were painted a dull yellow, faded in places and covered with water stains. Heavy curtains hung by the window, completely obscuring the view outside, but for some reason I didn't feel like pulling them back. The floorboards creaked underfoot, 
and the oppressive silence was broken only by the occasional thud of my heartbeat. I unpacked my things, carefully placing my travel bag on the chair by the bed. I took out a clean t-shirt, sweatpants, and a light jacket. Something comfortable for a quick run, which had become a ritual for me on the road. I changed, put on my sneakers, and glanced around the room. There was something unsettling about this place, but I decided not to dwell on it. I checked that I hadn't forgotten anything and left the room. In the corridor, I encountered a young couple who were just entering the room next to mine. The guy looked about 27, tall, with short cropped hair and a tanned face. He was wearing jeans and a t-shirt with the name of some music festival on it. The girl, slightly younger, looked quite cute. Long chestnut hair tied in a ponytail and a light dress with a floral pattern. They looked happy, whispering and laughing quietly, as if the world belonged only to the two of them. I nodded to them as I passed by, but they barely noticed me, absorbed in each other. As I descended the stairs, I felt a bit strange, as if I was an outsider in this world of joy and carefreeness. When I passed by the registration desk, the old woman gave me a strange, piercing look. A shadow flickered in her eyes. Perhaps it was weariness, or maybe something else. It was as if she knew something, something that I would be better off not knowing. That look made me feel slightly uneasy, as if I suddenly realized I had done something wrong but didn't know what. I quickly averted my eyes and headed for the exit. Outside, the air was fresh but cool, as it often is in early autumn. The sky was cloudless, and the full moon hung high, bathing everything around in its cold, silvery light. The moonlight cast long shadows from the sparse trees along the road, making them look like black patches scattered across the barren landscape. I decided to go for a short run along the road before returning to the motel. For me, this was routine. On the roads, the hardest part is staying awake behind the wheel, but it's equally important to stay in shape. A sedentary lifestyle is deadly, as doctors say, and I always tried to stick to my minimum of 5,000 steps. A run in these parts, though a bit risky, was necessary to relieve tension and maintain fitness. I began running along the road, trying to stay close to the shoulder. The surroundings seemed even more desolate than during the day. The wind rustled the grass and the occasional shrubs, creating barely audible whispers. The moonlight illuminated the road ahead, but dark, impenetrable shadows lurked around every bend. There were no cars in sight, as if the whole world had stopped, and I was left alone in this silence. Each step echoed in the night, and soon I could hear only my own breathing and the beating of my heart. It was empty around me, just the road, a light strip stretching ahead and fading into the darkness. Sometimes it seemed I could hear distant sounds, perhaps the crack of branches, or maybe just the wind playing tricks on my imagination. But every time I looked back, I saw only emptiness and shadows, behind which no one seemed to be hiding. Suddenly, headlights appeared in the distance. A car slowly emerged from the darkness, its tires quietly brushing against the asphalt. It was a dark-colored Prius with barely noticeable reflections on the windows. The interior was dim, and I couldn't make out who was inside. Just for a moment, and the car had already passed me, disappearing behind my shoulder. I turned around and saw the taillights turn towards the motel. I didn't give it much thought and continued running. But a few minutes later I noticed another light. Only this time it was brighter and heavier. A trailer rolled onto the road. Its peeling walls and rusty metal parts looked like they had come from another time. I glanced at the trailer and something about it made me uneasy. It seemed too old, too shabby like one of those that should have been scrapped long ago. But for some reason it was still on the road, still moving. 
The trailer also headed towards the motel and disappeared around the bend. The second vehicle filled me with a strange unease, and I decided it was time to head back. Turning around, I ran back down the same road, trying to keep my pace. As I approached the motel, I slowed down to catch my breath. In the parking lot, I saw the same Prius. The car doors opened, and two men got out. They were arguing heatedly. Their gestures were sharp, but I couldn't make out their words. Eventually, they fell silent and quickly disappeared inside the motel. I continued walking around trying to recover after the run and glanced at the trailer. Its door creaked open, and an elderly couple emerged. First, the man slowly climbed out of the cab. He looked as though the weight of years had literally pressed him into the ground. Tall but hunched, with bony arms covered in a network of veins and skin that looked like parchment. His sparse gray hair stuck out haphazardly, and deep shadows lay under his eyes, as if he hadn't slept in a long time. He scanned the parking lot and with some effort took a step forward, as if each step was a struggle. Behind him appeared the woman. She was even more fragile, almost ethereal, as if one clumsy movement could break her. Her face was gaunt, with wrinkles crisscrossing it in different directions, giving her the appearance of a marble statue that had weathered too many winters. She remained silent, occasionally nodding when the man glanced at her. They slowly made their way to the back of the trailer. The man opened the trailer's door with noticeable effort. At first it was dark inside, but then I saw them start to pull out a huge suitcase. It was a massive, old suitcase with worn upholstery, covered in scratches and stains, as if it had been thrown and dragged across the ground many times. It looked so large and heavy that a person could easily fit inside. The suitcase's wheels squeaked loudly, as if protesting against the weight. The couple moved in sync, as if they had rehearsed this ritual many times. They bent, strained, and adjusted their grip on the suitcase, trying not to drop it. The man firmly held onto the rope tied to the suitcase's handle, while the woman supported it from the other side, her bony fingers trembling with effort. Their faces remained impassive, as if they were performing something ordinary, routine, rather than lugging around a huge piece of luggage that was clearly too much for them. When they finally started moving, dragging the suitcase across the parking lot, I noticed they avoided looking around, as if trying to disappear into the shadows. There was something so strange and unnatural about the scene that a chill ran down my spine. I held my breath, watching them until they disappeared behind the motel door leaving me in complete silence. Something about this sight wouldn't let me rest. Curiosity got the better of me, and I decided to get a closer look at the trailer they had arrived in. It looked old, battered, with rust along the edges and peeling paint. It seemed like it had long outlived its time, but somehow it was still standing on its wheels. As I approached, I noticed a slightly open window in the living area of the trailer. I couldn't resist the urge and stepped closer to peek inside. The moment I did, a strong stench of decay hit me, so intense that I nearly vomited. Damn it, how could those crazy old folks tolerate such a foul odor? I backed away, trying not to breathe, cursing myself for my excessive curiosity, and headed back to the motel. When I entered the lobby, I witnessed a scene. The old couple was standing at the registration desk, talking to the owner. She was frowning, grumbling as she explained that there were no rooms left on the first floor. They were all occupied. The last two rooms had gone to those who arrived earlier. The old couple exchanged glances, as if sharing silent thoughts, then agreed to the suggestion of moving to the second floor. I watched as they struggled to lift their enormous suitcase up the narrow staircase. The suitcase creaked, its wheels got stuck in every crack, 
and the elderly couple, puffing and groaning, moved painfully slowly as if time itself was pushing them back. It looked like torture, and I couldn't bear to watch it for long without doing something. With some difficulty, I overcame my disgust and approached them, offering my help. As soon as I got close, I was hit by that same repulsive smell I had noticed at the trailer. That putrid stench, emanating from both them and the suitcase, sent waves of nausea through me, but I suppressed it and grabbed the suitcase's handle. The suitcase was heavy, much heavier than I had expected. I strained to lift it with them and suddenly I felt something move inside. My heart skipped a beat in shock. What the hell? Could these crazy old folks be hiding something alive inside? Or was it just my imagination? I tried not to show my fear, though my mind suddenly filled with all sorts of disturbing thoughts. We managed to drag the suitcase to the top, and I helped them reach their door. Room number eight, right next to mine. The old man thanked me with a short nod, while the old woman muttered something under her breath but I couldn't make out her words. When they finally disappeared behind the door, I felt the tension begin to ease, but the unsettling feeling that I had just encountered something dangerous and unfamiliar wouldn't leave me. When I finally returned to my room, strange thoughts about the elderly couple wouldn't leave me alone. Everything about them seemed wrong. Their appearance, that foul-smelling suitcase, and especially the moment when something inside the suitcase had moved. I wondered if I should call the police, but common sense reminded me that the nearest station was probably an hour's drive away. Besides, what would I tell them? I helped some old folks carry a suitcase that was too heavy and smelled like decay. Fatigue gradually took over, and I decided not to dwell on it. After a quick shower, I lay down in bed and, despite my anxious thoughts, quickly fell asleep. I was awakened by a strange sound, as if something was scratching against the wall in the neighboring room. The room was pitch dark. Reaching for my smartphone, I checked the time. 2 a.m. I raised the phone higher, hoping to find a signal, but the antenna was dead. No connection. In places like this, that was no surprise. This was real wilderness. Lying in bed, I listened to what was happening next door. The scratching continued, slow and monotonous, as if someone or something was clawing at the wallpaper, trying to break free. Suddenly, I heard a strange sound. Something like a dog growling, but not quite. A muffled, dull growl, as if it was coming from underground. Could they have a dog in that suitcase? The thought crossed my mind. But why? Then there was a sudden dull thud, as if something heavy had fallen to the floor. For a moment everything went silent and I thought it was over. But then the noise resumed. Something began pounding violently against the wall, as if trying to break through from the inside. There was such wildness and desperation in that sound that chills ran down my spine. I couldn't take it anymore. Grabbing my clothes, I quickly put them on and decided to step into the corridor to complain to the neighbors about the noise. Opening the door, I was met with a strange sight. The young guy from the neighboring room, the one with the girl, was walking down the corridor with a slow, shuffling gait, like a zombie. His movements were mechanical, lifeless. His arms were twisted in an unnatural position, and he was slightly hunched over, as if under the weight of an invisible force. His head was tilted to the side, and he stared up at the ceiling with glassy eyes, devoid of any life. Behind him, the girl was running, her face wet with tears, desperately calling his name, trying to stop him. "'What's happening to you?' she cried. But the guy didn't respond at all. When she saw me, she screamed, Help me, sir, something's wrong with him. I looked at the guy and horror gripped me. He really did look like a real zombie, like a reanimated corpse from a nightmare. 
As he passed me, I tried to grab his arm, but it felt as if I had grabbed a frozen corpse. His body was cold and rigid, like stone. Instinctive fear overwhelmed me. It felt as though if he were to hit me now, I'd be sent flying several meters. I decided to step back and see what would happen next. The girl continued to follow him, sobbing uncontrollably. He descended the stairs without stopping. I don't know how he managed it in that state, but soon he was on the first floor. The motel owner rushed out of her corner yelling, What's going on? The girl just kept crying, and the guests from the first floor had all rushed out of their rooms, shocked by what they were seeing. The guy kept walking without looking back and soon went outside. Everyone stood stunned, unable to comprehend what was happening. We all ran outside after the guy and the girl, and I saw him heading toward the trees that grew alongside the motel. The moonlight illuminated part of the path, but in the shadows of the trees, almost nothing was visible. This guy, as if driven by an invisible force, was marching straight into that darkness. The girl, all the while crying and pleading, followed him. She kept looking back at us, begging for help, but we stood there paralyzed, shocked by what we were witnessing, unable to decide what to do. The two men from the Prius and the biker I'd seen earlier stopped beside me. One of them, looking at me, asked, What the hell is going on here? But I had no answer. None of us did. We just stood there, watching as the guy and the girl disappeared into the shadows of the trees, frozen as if hypnotized, waiting for whatever might happen next. Suddenly, the night was pierced by a terrifying, desperate scream. It was so horrific, so filled with indescribable fear and pain, that I felt icy terror grip me. From the darkness where they had gone, the girl suddenly burst out into the open. In the moonlight and under the dim street lamp I could see she was covered in blood. Her clothes were torn, her hair disheveled, and she looked as though she had just experienced something so horrific that no words could describe it. She ran towards us, gasping for breath and literally collapsed at our feet, as if she had exhausted all her strength. At that moment, the air was filled with a terrifying roar. The sound was so powerful that my knees shook, and my mind refused to believe that a human could make such a noise. It was the roar of something wild, something that shouldn't exist. We all stood there, paralyzed, not knowing what to do. I finally snapped out of my stupor and rushed to the girl, trying to help her up. The two men from the Prius also approached, supporting her under her arms. But the biker had vanished, as if he had never been there. The roar continued, mixed with a horrible sound like chewing, as if someone or something in the darkness was devouring its prey. I suddenly realized what was happening, and one thought came to mind. Run. Apparently the two men standing beside me had the same idea. Without a word, they dashed to their Prius, quickly opened the doors, and jumped inside. But when I glanced toward the car, I saw that the driver looked confused, as if he didn't understand what was happening. But I didn't have time to think about that. I had an injured girl in my arms, her limp body barely standing. I held her tightly and ran back toward the motel. As I approached the building, I saw the old lady, the motel owner. She was standing on the porch, shocked, her eyes wide open, watching what was happening. There was genuine fear in her eyes. Call the police now, I shouted, trying to convey the urgency of the situation. The old woman, with trembling hands, reached for the landline phone at the registration desk and began dialing. But as soon as she put the receiver to her ear, her face filled with even more horror. She slowly shook her head, desperately pressing the buttons again and again. There's no connection, she whispered, her voice full of helplessness. The dial tone was dead, 
the line was cut off. At that moment I realized we were trapped. Everything happening around us was becoming less and less explainable and more and more terrifying. Suddenly the two men from the Prius burst into the lobby, their faces pale with fear. One of them, gasping for breath, asked me, You drove here, right? Check if your truck works. Our car won't start. That news genuinely scared me. Something was clearly wrong. I quickly looked at the old woman and asked, Where can I put the girl? She nodded and pointed to the back room behind the registration desk. There was an old, worn-out sofa where I carefully laid her down. The girl was still in shock, but at least she was conscious. I rushed upstairs, grabbed my truck keys, and hurried back down, ready to dash to the parking lot. But at the exit, I bumped into the biker. He was standing in the doorway with a shotgun in his hands, clearly ready for action. He raised his hand to stop me and said in a quiet but firm voice, Don't go. It's too dangerous. I wanted to argue with him, but stopped. He was right. The creature, whatever it was, was still out there, and we had no connection to the outside world. We were trapped. I suggested to the biker that we go to the parking lot together. He hesitated for a moment, then nodded. All right. We'll check together, he said, and we stepped outside, slowly, cautiously, constantly looking around and listening. The night was incredibly quiet, as if time itself had frozen. It seemed that the creature had finished its work, but the silence only heightened the tension. We carefully approached my truck. I opened the door, got behind the wheel, and turned the key. The engine cranked a couple of times, but didn't start. Damn it, I thought, feeling a chill run down my spine. The biker, as if expecting this, only frowned slightly, but didn't look surprised. Then we headed to his pickup. He opened the door, got inside, and tried to start it. The result was the same. Silence, just a quiet click from the starter, and nothing more. This is bad. The biker muttered, stepping out of the vehicle. He opened the glove compartment and pulled out a pistol. His expression was serious as he handed it to me. You seem reliable, he said as he passed the weapon to me. The name's Bill, he introduced himself. Michael, I replied, taking the pistol. I had some experience using one, so after checking the safety, I tucked it under my shirt. When I returned to the motel, I noticed that another person had joined the group. He was a man who, at first glance, was repulsive. He looked like a typical thug from a bad movie, a massive body, broad shoulders, but with a noticeable gut that betrayed his love for alcohol or fast food. He was wearing a leather vest over an old shirt, and his arms were covered in tattoos that seemed to run from his wrists to his shoulders. His face was heavy, with rough features, a low forehead, deep wrinkles, and a sharp, chiseled chin. His eyes were hidden under thick brows, and his gaze was hard and piercing, like someone used to solving problems with force. He wore dark glasses despite the night, so I couldn't see his eyes, but even without that, I could feel that he was looking at everyone with suspicion and hidden aggression. He smelled of cheap tobacco and stale sweat. Apparently, he was another motel guest who had recently woken up and, like us, was now caught up in this nightmare. His presence only added to the already tense atmosphere, making everyone feel even more uneasy. As soon as I stepped into the lobby, the two men from the Prius immediately approached me, their faces filled with anxiety. How did it go? Did it start? One of them, tall and thin, asked, his voice shaky with uncertainty. No, I replied. My truck wouldn't start either. Something's happened or something's knocked them out. We're trapped. We all stood in the lobby, glancing at one another, realizing that the situation was growing more desperate by the minute. We were locked in a trap with an unknown monster outside, and we had neither communication nor transportation to escape. 
My gaze settled on one of the men from the Prius, who looked like he was on the verge of a nervous breakdown. He was thin, with sharp facial features, slicked back hair, and thin lips that trembled nervously. His hands shook, and he kept glancing around as if expecting something terrible to jump out at any moment. It was clear this man wasn't used to facing challenges or stress. His nervousness was contagious, and I thought that if he snapped, it would be bad for all of us. Realizing that the tension in the group was rising, I decided to go talk to the girl we had brought inside. Perhaps she had calmed down enough to give us more information about what had happened out there in the darkness among the trees. With Bill by my side, I headed to the room where we had left her on the sofa. Entering the room, I saw the girl sitting on the sofa holding a cup of tea. She wasn't drinking it, just staring at a fixed point in front of her. Her state was far from good, but at least she was responding to her surroundings. When Bill and I entered, she slowly turned her head toward us. In her eyes, I saw fear and despair so deep that it was clear whatever she had experienced had pushed her to the edge. I approached her, sitting on the edge of the sofa, and trying to speak as gently as possible, asked, Can you tell us what you saw? It's really important. As soon as I said this, her hands started to tremble, and the tea in the cup began to spill, leaving dark stains on her lap. It was obvious she didn't want to talk, as if just thinking about it brought the horror back to life. I leaned in slightly closer and continued, Please, we need to know what happened. It could help us deal with whatever's out there. My words seemed to reach her. She froze, and a flicker of understanding crossed her eyes. Taking a deep breath, she began to speak, but her voice was shaky as if each word was a struggle to get out. It was dark out there, but I thought, it looked like a wolf or a dog, something hairy. It moved so fast, her voice quivered, and each word seemed to tear itself from her chest. With one leap, it tore Ryan's head off. Tears welled up in her eyes, but she continued as if something was pushing her to keep going. When I screamed, it didn't chase me. It just stared. Like I was its prey, knowing I wouldn't get away. I felt it on a primal level. We're all just food to it. After those words, she fell silent, as if retreating into herself, refusing to say more. I looked at Bill, and he returned my gaze, full of worry. We understood that she had witnessed something truly horrifying. With a sigh, we decided to leave her alone for a while, hoping she'd recover a bit. We left the room and returned to the lobby, where the others were waiting with tense expressions. There we held a brief meeting, trying to decide what to do next. Someone suggested that we all leave together down the road, hoping the creature wouldn't follow us. But another person argued that it would be better to wait until morning defending ourselves here in the motel. I was inclined to stay. If we ventured out onto the open road, the creature could attack from the darkness at any moment, and our chances would be even slimmer. We debated, discussing possible plans, when suddenly a sharp, piercing scream echoed from upstairs. The sound sliced through the night's silence, sending chills down our spines. Everyone froze, instantly forgetting our arguments and plans. I looked around and noticed that the motel owner wasn't among us. My heart sank, and I quickly asked the two men from the Prius, where did she go? One of them, still shaken, answered, she went upstairs, so it must have been her screaming. Horrible thoughts started racing through my mind. We didn't immediately rush upstairs, as if something was holding us back. Perhaps an instinctive fear of what we might find. I slowly drew the pistol, feeling the cold metal against my palm. Bill gripped his shotgun tighter, his jaw clenched with tension. 
We exchanged glances and I nodded, signaling that it was time to go. We moved toward the stairs, ascending the creaky steps slowly, trying to stay quiet. Each step echoed in the empty corridor, and it felt like even the walls could hear us coming. When we reached the second floor, a scene unfolded before us that made me freeze in my tracks. There was blood, lots of blood. Dark stains spattered the wooden floorboards, forming a trail along the wall. In the dim light of the lamp, we could see bloody handprints smeared across the wall, as if someone had desperately tried to hold on, fighting for their life, but had been dragged forward against their will. We cautiously followed the trail, our eyes scanning the bloodstains, trying to piece together what had happened. I heard Bill exhale quietly, as if he couldn't believe his eyes. The trail led us to a window at the end of the corridor, which was wide open. The curtains swayed gently in the breeze, as if beckoning us to look into the darkness outside. I stood still, feeling cold sweat forming on my forehead. It looked like the old woman had been taken. I remembered the elderly couple living in the room next to mine. We needed to check on them. I approached their door and knocked. Silence. I tried again, but there was no response. I then turned the handle. The door was unlocked. Carefully, I pushed it open and peeked inside. The room looked like a battleground. Signs of a struggle were everywhere. An overturned table, scattered belongings and rumpled bed covers. Dirty footprints marred the floor, and among them were bloodstains. Blood was nearly everywhere. On the floor, on the walls, on the furniture. But the elderly couple was gone. The place seemed to scream of the horror that had taken place there but no one could answer where these people had gone. Bill, standing beside me, was dumbfounded, scanning the room in disbelief at what we were seeing. As we descended back to the lobby, we relayed to the others what we had discovered upstairs. Faces went pale. Some people began nervously whispering among themselves, while others just stood there, stunned by what they had heard. Gathering my thoughts... I decided to tell everyone about the suitcase, about how I felt something move inside it, and the foul stench that emanated from it. I suspect those old folks aren't as harmless as they seem, I said, looking at the faces of those gathered. Everyone was shocked by my story. The tension in the air was almost palpable. I glanced at the skinny guy from the Prius, and it seemed like he was about to have a breakdown. He looked like he was on the verge of snapping, his hands trembling, eyes darting around as if searching for an escape from this nightmare. My intuition didn't fail me. Suddenly, he jumped to his feet, shaking nervously, and shouted, We can't stay here. We need to just run. His voice was filled with panic and despair. The other man, who was with him, also jumped up and tried to calm him down. Calm down. We'll get through this. We just need to think it through. But the guy pushed him away, glaring at him with anger. You always think you're the smartest. That's always pissed me off. Honestly, I hate you. His words sounded like an accusation, stirring up the already tense atmosphere. After saying that, he abruptly turned and ran outside. We didn't have time to react, it all happened too quickly. The second man, shocked by this turn of events, shouted after him, Stop! Wait! But the guy didn't even look back. We all rushed to the door and ran outside. The single light in the parking lot illuminated the darkness, casting the fleeing figure in stark relief. He was running fast, desperately, as if trying to escape all his fears. He dashed past the cars, heading toward the road, as if the distant lights might save him from the horror lurking in the shadows. His friend wanted to chase after him, but Bill grabbed his arm firmly and stopped him. Don't do it. He's already out of our reach. I thought the man would resist, but
but he just stood there, exhausted, watching silently as his friend ran farther away. The scene felt surreal, as if we were caught in a nightmare where events spiraled out of control. We stood at the motel's threshold, watching as the guy's figure flickered in the light before vanishing into the darkness, dissolving like a ghost. For a moment there was complete silence, broken only by the rustling leaves in the wind and the shadows of the trees, which seemed to reach out from the darkness like ominous hands. But the silence didn't last long. Suddenly the night was torn apart by a piercing scream, so desperate and filled with pain that it made my heart clench. The scream came from the direction where the guy had disappeared, and then it was replaced by a beastly growl that turned into a roar, a sound that chilled the blood in our veins. It was the same roar we had heard before, only this time it was closer, much closer. We all realized that the creature had been hiding out there all along, waiting for its next victim. There was no saving the guy. He was doomed. We stood there, stunned by the horrific realization, not knowing what to do, until we understood that we needed to get back inside immediately. In a panic, we rushed back into the motel and locked the door behind us, bolting and barricading it with everything we could find. I knew that if the creature decided to attack, it could easily get in through the windows, but a locked door at least gave us an illusion of safety. We huddled on the floor in the lobby, trying to process what to do next. The second man from the Prius was still in shock, his hands trembling uncontrollably, his gaze vacant. Finally, he decided to speak. My name is Harry, he introduced himself, and Bill and I nodded in acknowledgement. That guy, his name was Jeremy. We worked together at a company that serviced gas boilers. We were on our way to a job in a nearby town. We didn't always get along, you know, but I never thought it would end like this. His voice trembled, and he was clearly shaken by his colleague's death. Bill and I listened to him, then introduced ourselves. The man who looked like a thug was still standing in the corridor, but he remained silent, glaring at us as if blaming us for everything that had happened. His gaze was heavy brooding, and I decided not to try to engage him in conversation. We sat in silence for a while, each of us lost in our grim thoughts. I glanced at my watch. It was 3 a.m. earlier. It had felt like time had slowed down, but now in this eerie waiting, it seemed to stretch out torturously long. Suddenly Harry broke the silence. We need to find those old folks. If they're connected to this creature, they might know what's going on, he said, looking at us. I nodded, understanding that this might be our only chance. They came in that trailer, I recalled, and Harry immediately suggested we check it out, in case there were any clues. Everyone agreed, and we carefully stood up, unlocking the bolt. We moved slowly, cautiously scanning our surroundings, expecting an attack at any moment. The lights in the parking lot cast faint glows, casting long shadows, and every rustle, every sound, made our hearts clench with fear. The old folks trailer was parked in the farthest corner of the lot, as if deliberately hidden in the darkness. As we got closer, we saw that the trailer was even more dilapidated than it had seemed at first glance. The siding was peeling away in places, and the windows were covered with a layer of grime. I slowly opened the door, and we were immediately hit by an unbearable stench of decay. I covered my nose with my hand, trying to suppress the urge to vomit. Bill and Harry did the same, and we entered, lighting our way with our phone flashlights. Inside, the trailer was filthy, as if it hadn't been cleaned in years. Blood had dried on the floor and walls, leaving dark, sticky stains. I looked around, trying to find anything that could help us, when I heard Harry cursing in the back of the trailer. He had stumbled upon something horrific. 
we all headed to the rear of the trailer and saw something that made our hair stand on end. There, amid the dirt and clutter, lay the remains of human bodies. Severed limbs, scraps of clothing, and blood. So much blood. The sight of those remains made me take a step back, struggling to cope with the horror. There was no doubt left. Those old folks were indeed connected to the creature. But that wasn't all. Among the debris and filth, we noticed children's drawings and books neatly stacked in a corner. The drawings depicted people and strange creatures, something like hybrids between humans and beasts, as well as scenes that, in the context of everything we had seen, looked eerie and painful. The three of us realized that staying here any longer was not an option. The oppressive atmosphere of the trailer weighed on us, and we decided to get out. When we stepped outside, the fresh air felt like a true blessing. What we had seen inside the trailer was a living nightmare, and the horror was accompanied by an unbearable stench. I wanted to forget it as quickly as possible, but I couldn't shake the feeling that I might not make it until morning. Suddenly, I heard the sound of someone vomiting. Turning around, I saw it was Harry. He was bent over, emptying his stomach from the shock of what we had witnessed inside the trailer. It wasn't a pleasant sight, but I stayed alert, gripping the pistol tightly and scanning the surroundings. Suddenly the unpleasant man who had also come with us widened his eyes, pointed into the distance and said, Look, there's a car coming. We all turned to see the headlights of a vehicle approaching the motel. It was our salvation, a glimmer of hope in this night of terror. We stood there, watching as the car slowly made its way down the road and turned toward the motel. In the light of the street lamp, we could see it was an old sedan. Inside were two people, a man and a woman. They looked at us warily, and I quickly understood why. Bill was still holding his shotgun. Damn it! I cursed, holding back Harry, who had already started to rush toward them. His impulsive move could scare these people, and they might just turn around and leave. I hid my pistol and began approaching the car slowly, trying not to make any sudden movements. Suddenly the driver, the man behind the wheel, started to open the door. I caught a glimpse of him as he got out and asked, What's going on here? At that moment, something unexpected happened. From the darkness, almost invisible and swift, the creature leaped at him. It was too fast for us to get a clear look, but I saw the vague outline of a massive fur-covered beast. It moved with lightning speed, and the street lamp's light only briefly highlighted its silhouette. Bill reacted instantly. He fired his shotgun, and the unpleasant man, who I now realized also had a weapon, began shooting as well. We aimed at the creature's outline, hoping that at least one of our shots would hit the target. The creature was clearly wounded. It let out a roar full of rage and pain and disappeared into the darkness. We ran to the man, who was severely injured. The woman in the car ran out screaming, her voice tearing through the night's silence. Everything was happening too quickly, like a nightmare where events rushed by without leaving time to think. Without wasting any time, Bill grabbed the injured man and dragged him inside the motel. Meanwhile, I noticed that the unpleasant man, taking advantage of the chaos, had jumped into the car. He was clearly trying to drive away, but when he attempted to start the engine, nothing happened. The car remained still, as if caught in some anomaly where engines refused to work. The driver had managed to shut it off before the creature attacked, but now it was all useless. I shot the man a final look of contempt and headed inside the motel, realizing that the rescue we had hoped for was not going to happen. We were once again trapped, only this time with an injured man who desperately needed help. We carried the injured man inside the motel and carefully laid him on the couch in the lobby. His wounds were horrific, 
deep cuts and torn flesh, but despite everything, he was still alive. The woman, presumably his wife, sat beside him, screaming and crying, unable to believe what was happening. I quickly ran to the reception desk, frantically searching through drawers and cabinets for a first aid kit. Not finding one, I hurried to the back room, rummaging through everything, trying to find something useful. Eventually, I found a first aid kit, along with some bandages and antiseptics. With these in hand, I rushed back to the others. We began bandaging his wounds as best we could, trying to stop the bleeding. Bill applied bandages to the deepest cuts while I gave the man an antibiotic injection, hoping to prevent an infection. We were all on edge, knowing that any moment could be our last, but we tried to stay calm. The woman, sitting beside her husband, continued to cry, tears streaming down her cheeks, but she didn't leave his side, trying to help in any way she could. Bill and I stood nearby, pondering what to do next when the unpleasant man entered the room. He glanced at us with disdain, then stood by the wall, clearly not wanting to participate in what was happening. Time dragged on slowly. Every glance at the clock was torture. The hands showed 4.30 a.m. dawn was approaching, and it gave us a glimmer of hope. The girl who had earlier been in shock emerged from the back room. She had finally regained her composure. She walked toward the stairs, saying she needed to grab something from her room. I objected, knowing how dangerous it was, but she firmly stated that she was no longer afraid. We watched as she disappeared upstairs, and I silently prayed that nothing bad would happen. The man on the couch remained unconscious, while his wife continued to tend to him, her face filled with anxiety and despair. A few minutes passed, and suddenly we heard a piercing scream from upstairs. I cursed aloud, saying I had warned her. Bill and I immediately rushed upstairs, taking the steps two at a time. When we reached the corridor, I saw her. She was standing there, frozen in shock, staring toward her room. I ran to her and looked inside, and my blood ran cold. In the room, standing by the wall, was the old man, staring at us with a vacant yet sinister gaze. On the bed sat the old woman, and on her lap lay the creature we had all feared to see in person. It was a dogman. The hairy beast had gray-brown, matted fur, a long tail that swayed slowly from side to side. Its body was emaciated like that of a stray dog, but there was an unmistakable inhuman strength in it. The fur was unkempt, clumped together, as if it had never been brushed and in some places it had fallen out, revealing scars on the skin. Its head resembled that of a wolf, with a long snout and large eerie eyes that glowed in the dim light of the room. The teeth, massive and sharp, were visible in its slightly open jaws. It stared at us, and I felt my heart clench with terror. Bill quickly raised his shotgun, preparing to shoot, but the dogman reacted faster than we could have expected. It leaped from the old woman's lap and, with one powerful bound, darted toward the window. In the next second, there was the sound of shattering glass, and the creature disappeared into the night's darkness. We were still reeling from what we had seen, but mustering our strength, we entered the room. Weapons pointed at the old couple. "'What the hell is going on here?' I shouted, glaring at them. The old man slowly raised his hands, clearly not wanting to resist. His face was expressionless, as if none of this concerned him at all. The old woman also remained unresponsive, sitting on the bed as if nothing had happened. At that moment the unpleasant man burst into the room, a pistol in his hand. Seeing the old couple he began cursing at them furiously showering them with threats. "'You'll pay for this!' he yelled, pointing the gun directly at their faces. The situation was escalating by the second, and I could feel that we were on the brink of something terrible, 
but I didn't know what to do next. Suddenly, a scream echoed from downstairs. What now? I muttered, and Bill and I immediately turned and rushed downstairs. When we reached the lobby, we were met with a scene of terror. The woman clung to her husband, trembling with fear, her eyes wide open as if she had seen death itself. But there was no one else around. I approached her and asked, What happened? She gasped, whispering, There was a creature. I saw it. It came close to us. But then it disappeared. We began looking around, trying to find traces of the creature. But it was already gone. Perhaps it was just toying with us, waiting for the right moment to strike again. I turned to Bill and said, Stay here. Guard them. I'll go back upstairs and see what's going on. He nodded, gripping his shotgun tighter and remained in place, ready to protect the wounded man and his wife. When I returned to the room upstairs, I was met with a horrifying scene. The unpleasant man was inches away from the old woman, holding the pistol to her forehead. His face was twisted with rage, his eyes burning with a maniacal fire. What is that creature? Tell me, you old hag, he screamed. But the old woman remained silent, her gaze distant, as if she had already resigned herself to her fate. He then turned the pistol toward the old man. The old man stood in the corner, shifting uneasily, torn between fear and despair. Finally, the old man sighed heavily and began to speak, his voice trembling like that of someone who had carried this heavy burden for far too long. It's our son, he finally growled, his voice full of bitterness and pain. He was born like this, my wife got pregnant at 65. We were shocked. It was almost impossible since we never had children. We had lost hope. But when Aaron was born, we thought it was a dream, a miracle. The old man fell silent, as if recalling something too painful. His eyes welled up and he continued. When he started growing, we noticed something was wrong. At first it was small things odd habits, strange looks. But then, then he began to change. His voice grew quieter, almost a whisper, but each word sounded like a hammer striking an anvil. We couldn't abandon him. No matter what he was, he was our son. We loved him and tried to do everything we could to keep him alive, even though it cost us everything. He paused for a moment struggling to compose himself, then added, We moved from one town to another, hiding when we couldn't control him. But he hunted anyway. We did everything we could to protect him and others, but sometimes we were too late. Sometimes sacrifices had to be made. The old man fell silent, lowering his head, as if his words had drained the last of his strength. His face contorted with pain, not physical, but moral, deep, the kind that had eaten away at him for years. We, we tried. We didn't know how to deal with it, but he's our son, no matter what. Every word he spoke was filled with excruciating love and unbearable guilt. The old man knew that nothing could justify what had happened, but this was his only way to explain his despair, his actions, his attempts to hold on to whatever was left of what had once been their family. His voice, broken by deep breaths, seemed to reflect the weight of all those years filled with fear, horror, and an endless struggle to keep their only son, now turned into a monster, alive. This is our cross to bear, he finished quietly, raising his eyes again, and we'll carry it to the end. After the old man's words, a tense silence hung in the room. Suddenly the old woman, as if snapping out of a trance, screamed, Aaron! Her scream was piercing, filled with pain and fear, and the sound seemed to strike a nerve in all of us. The man holding the pistol panicked, and overcome by fear, pulled the trigger. The deafening shot rang out. The bullet hit the old woman square in the head, and she was thrown back onto the bed, blood splattering everywhere. I shouted, are you out of your mind? 
but it was too late. The man froze, realizing what he had done, and his face reflected a horror as if he had frightened himself with his own actions. The old man, seeing this, cursed, You bastard! His voice was filled with such rage and despair that it seemed he was ready to tear the man apart. He lunged at him, and they began to grapple violently. Their fists, faces, and bodies tangled in a chaotic whirlwind, but suddenly a mournful howl echoed from outside. It was so long and agonizing that it chilled us to the bone. Both men froze, as if the sound had paralyzed them. The man who had just killed the old woman started convulsing, as if battling with himself. His hands moved unnaturally, one trying to grab the gun, the other desperately holding it back, not allowing him to finish what he had started. It was a terrifying sight, as though his body had been taken over by some external force against which he was powerless. I was standing in the corridor when suddenly something flashed from the side, and in the next moment I was knocked off my feet by a powerful blow. I flew several meters, crashing into the wall, nearly losing consciousness. Pain shot through my sides and I could barely lift my head. My first thought was, what the hell was that? And soon I saw the answer. The same creature, the dogman, was already in the room. I tried to get up, though my hands were trembling and pain shot through every part of my body. Suddenly I heard a gunshot and a scream. My pistol had rolled nearby and mustering all my willpower, I crawled toward it. Rising to my knees, I moved toward the room where chaos was unfolding. When I reached the doorway, I froze in horror. The creature had sunk its teeth into the throat of the man who had just killed the old woman and with unimaginable strength flung his body aside. His blood painted the walls and floor a bright crimson. The creature, already wounded, leaped onto the bed where the dead old woman lay. It lifted her body into its arms and began to howl softly, as if mourning her. Meanwhile, the old man sat on the floor, his gaze empty, simply watching the horrifying scene unfold. Suddenly the creature lifted its head and looked directly at me. Its eyes were filled with indescribable pain and fury. A chill ran down my spine. My hands began to shake, but I still aimed. Holding my breath, I fired straight into its eye. The bullet pierced its skull, and in the next second I saw its brain splatter across the room. The creature collapsed onto the bed, dead. At that moment, Bill burst into the room. Seeing me, he rushed to help me up. Are you okay? He asked, his face pale but full of determination. I nodded, though I was still in shock from what had just happened. Together we entered the room, cautiously looking around. What we saw next left us utterly stunned. Where the dead creature had lain, there was now the naked body of a young man, about twenty years old. His body was thin and emaciated, but his facial features resembled the monster we had just fought. We stood there in horror and disbelief, realizing that we had encountered something truly supernatural. Shaken, we stepped outside. The sky in the east was beginning to lighten, and the first rays of the sun painted the horizon in pinkish hues. Morning was breaking, and everything that had happened started to feel like some strange, terrifying dream. Bill pulled out a cigarette, lit it, and took a deep drag. Exhaling, he said, We're going to have to come up with something to explain this, if it can even be explained. We stood in silence, watching the sun rise, knowing that we would have to face a new day burdened by the weight of what had occurred during the night.